to continue. We are so pleased today to welcome Dr. Kim Ma, who completed her medical oncology and hematology training at McGill University. Uh, she has been the primary investigator in multiple phase three clinical trials, focusing on breast and GI malignancies, as well as uh, the leading investigator, um, or as well as leading investigator initiated trials in her center. Uh, she was chief of OptiLab for two years, uh, where she gained insight into system management and optimizing the trajectory of care. Uh, since starting at the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal, uh, she is actively involved in opening a new hereditary GI clinic, which will be focused on timely prevention and intervention in this at-risk population. Um, so welcome, Kim. We are so happy to have you. I will just pass it over to Philomena um, to uh, to speak before we uh, to, before we get started with your presentation. Oh, thanks so much, Cassandra. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as a valued member of Cran's Medical Advisory Board, Dr. Ma, Dr. Ma was a lovely, lovely addition to the Cran family because she shares our patient-focused approach to care while providing evidence-based care in the management of colorectal cancer. She is compassionate, she is thoughtful, and she's brilliant in everything she does. And we are truly, truly grateful to have her. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kim Ma. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, so I think I'll just share my screen if if you don't mind, uh, and we'll get going. Let me just find it. Share. All right. Maybe let's go upwards here. Does everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Amazing. So I'll just put it in presentation mode. All right. So um, these are my disclosures. Um, so I thought the topic of medical management for colorectal cancer was kind of very broad. So I thought I would kind of break it down just in terms of time into kind of manageable size, bite-sized bits. And obviously this is not meant to be an exhaustive review of how I treat colorectal cancer in general. So obviously if there's any, you know, more pointed questions in all of this or, you know, something I did not address, please do not hesitate to ask at the end of my presentation. And so we know, and you know, this is mentioned uh, several times, and now we even have a dedicated young adult um, symposium about it, is that colorectal cancer um, is rising, especially in less than 50 years old. So while you see, you know, in the 50s to 65 and the 65 and above, you see the curves really go down. Unfortunately, we're really seeing a rise in the younger adult. And this is not something purely in North America, but if you see across the world, uh, specifically in kind of more developed countries, North America, Europe, you're really seeing a sharp rise in incidence. It is to the extent that uh, the US Preventative Service Task Force has actually issued new guidelines about two years ago now, uh, lowering the colonoscopy uh, screening age group from 50 to 45. So this is a worldwide recognized phenomena and unfortunately phenomena we don't quite understand. And of note, if you kind of look at cancer death um, incidents, colorectal is actually number one in young males and number two in young females uh, behind breast cancer. And so very briefly, um, and this is very basic, um, the staging of colon cancer, we always think about size, but in colon cancer, the depth of the invasion, so how far does it go beyond the wall of the colon is more important than the absolute size of your tumor. Okay, so stage one, essentially, it's not very deep, as you can see into the wall. Stage two is a little bit deeper. Stage three, not only is it invading the wall, but there's usually lymph nodes involved. And stage four is when it starts spreading to other organs, what we call metastases. And so, you know, when we kind of stage cancers, and this is valid for many cancers that we deal with, we are usually take, talking for stage one to four. Now, very briefly, we're going to focus on the what we call early stage. So early stage, um, because we're talking systemic medical treatment today, I am not going to mention stage one, mainly because there's really no role for medical management in the stage one other than um, lifestyle modifications. However, when we're talking about systemic treatment, so what um, generally we refer to as chemotherapy, 
we're really talking stage two and more. So when we're talking about stage two and three, um, we usually talk in colorectal cancer of adjuvant therapy. So adjuvant therapy is essentially any therapy that is given after the primary treatment of the cancer. And in colon cancer, the primary treatment is surgery, okay? So surgery will take out the cancer, they'll take out some lymph nodes, they'll take out the primary, and whatever you give after is called adjuvant. And in, depending on the cancer, we can talk about chemo, we can talk about radiation, we can talk about hormone therapy, but in colon cancer, we're mainly focusing on chemotherapy. And again, this is kind of more dependent on tumor site. Now, again, this is not meant to be exhaustive, but know that, um, you know, there are guidelines here. These are the European guidelines. I like them because they're nicely algorithmic and kind of a little bit more simplified than what we find in the American guidelines. But you can see here that, you know, even in stage two, you can be divided into a low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And these are kind of dependent on pathology findings. So once they take out the primary tumor, they kind of analyze it under the microscope, and there's a whole bunch of things they can look Look at such as lymphatic invasion, for instance, and um, clinical factors such as, well, if you present obstructed or perforated, these will immediately in increase your risk factors. And then depending on the risk, um, the guidelines do recommend or not uh, recommend uh, what we call adjuvant chemotherapy in the case of colon cancer. Um, in stage three colon cancers, um, the usual expert opinion is that all stage threes, barring uh, significant comorbidities, et cetera, is that we really should be probably given chemotherapy. Where the controversy lies is actually the duration of, of chemotherapy, okay? So a lot of times we mention, you know, six months of chemotherapy. More recently, there's been a study looking at three months of chemotherapy. And again, it's kind of dependent on what we call the risk stratification in stage three colon cancers. And those are dependent on the depth of invasion of the colon cancer and the number of lymph nodes involved. And to make a long story short, essentially, if you don't, if you have one to three lymph nodes, if your tumor is not so big, you probably can get away with three months. But if you are a very big tumor, especially if it's invading something like a bladder or, or adjacent organs, or you have a lot of lymph nodes, definitely we should probably still be aiming for six months of chemotherapy. And so you can see here that, you know, currently as it stands, if you were to present at your oncologist uh, office, um, the decision whether or not to give adjuvant chemotherapy is very largely based on clinical and pathological findings. So what's the stage of your colon cancer, the number of lymph nodes involved, the, the depth of invasion of your tumor, and you know what we call risk factors. So whether or not it's on the pathology, so on the surgical specimen, when they take it out and analyze it, there's a whole bunch of risk factors, or whether or not uh, there are certain clinical presentations that automatically put you at higher risk of recurrence. But the question is obviously, well, these are kind of clinical criteria. How can we better find the patients who would actually really benefit from chemotherapy? Is there not like kind of a more objective blood test we could do or something that we could do that, you know, would better define who would actually benefit from chemotherapy? So this, I thought I would mention because it is a hot topic and you'll see it a lot across tumor sites. Um, so it's a concept of cell-free DNA. So um, although most of our DNA is in cells in our bodies, whether it's in our skin cells, our, our solid organs, and our blood cells, um, there are certain DNA that's kind of just free floating in our blood. And we can actually extract it from our plasma and analyze it. The majority of cell-free DNA that's circulating in our blood is actually from our healthy tissue, you know, that degrades and it's the natural turnover of cells in our body. However, there is a minority of this cell-free DNA that we call circulating tumor DNA. So the concept that, you know, part of the cell-free DNA is actually um, tumor DNA that's just free-floating. And the interest of that is obviously, well, you know, instead of doing a scan or instead of doing, um, you know, invasive biopsies, can we not just analyze these circulating tissue DNA? As you can imagine, there are several barriers to this. Um, it is a growing market. It is a, you know, it is a hot topic, as I said, and more and more you will see research, um, clinical trials integrating the analysis of 
um, ctDNA, so circulating tissue DNA, into their research protocol. And again, the concept is that can we get away from doing the scans? Can we get away from doing the invasive biopsies? And can we find a way to really identify patients who might benefit more from uh, chemo systemic therapies. The problem with D uh, CT DNA is that, as I just mentioned, it is a minority of these kind of free floating uh, cell free DNA. So the sensitivity of, of uh, CT DNA is still something that we are very much still working on. And because the last thing we want to do is to give ourselves false reassurance, your CT DNA is negative on your blood test, but it's just not maybe it's not sensitive enough to capture these very small tumors or these tumors that are very well hidden in, in the body. And so, you know, you will see some studies out there looking at uh, CT DNA. Um, this is an example that was published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, where essentially they analyzed um, patients' CT DNA. If you had CT DNA positive, you got chemotherapy. And if you were CT DNA negative, essentially you did not get chemotherapy therapy, and they compared it to, you know, what we usually do, right? Um, the staging, the lymph nodes, etc. And essentially what they seem to show is that, you know, patients seem to do as well, you know, on the CTDNA guided group versus the standard group. What we do not know yet, and these are trials that are ongoing, is that, for instance, if you are CTDNA negative, do you need chemotherapy? We don't have that randomization there. So you have to be very careful when you interpret these studies um, in that it is an interesting signal, but it is not a definitive answer as we stand today. And um, this is, I'm gonna seg right into it. Uh, the reason I do mention this, I mean, because I mean, you know, it's all very nice and dandy, but if you don't have access to CTDNA, you know, this talk is a little bit useless, but note that CCTG, so the, um, the Canadian Cancer Trials Group are actively investigating um, this issue. And there's several trials that have been ongoing in the past few years. This is the one that just opened um, just last week, actually in my center, but it is available across Canada. And again, I would like you to refer um, so this is kind of the information for the trial. Um, and if you just kind of go on the CCTG website, you know, you have actual uh, PDF information and you can actually access um, and see where this trial is available. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of, uh, so that's CTDNA in a very brief nutshell. Moving on to um, uh, more what I call advanced stage colon cancer. Uh, you will often hear it um, referred to as metastatic or stage four. These this vocabulary often, these are just syn synonyms of um, cancer that has spread beyond the colon, beyond the local lymph nodes. And you will be hearing, you know, in, in later topics, you know, uh, if it spreads only to the liver, we'll have a talk on that. If it spreads only to the lungs, we'll have a talk on that. But know that stage four encompasses all those entities altogether. And so um, in the more advanced colon cancer, um, we'll kind of briefly go through Canadian biomarker testing guidelines. So these came out a couple of years ago, and it is actually a pretty easy read, even for uh, people who are not in the medical field. I mean, there's a few, you know, obviously molecular technical terms, but I think this is an important document um, that we should be referring to. Um, Obviously, biomarker testing um, is based on um, therapies that we can offer based on these biomarker testing. And obviously, um, you know, there's always new data coming out. So I thought I could, you know, maybe slide a couple words on um, the newest data that's been shown um, in the past year. So this is the guideline I was mentioning um, to you. I mean, these are this is Canadian based, so a lot of the big names in Canadian colorectal cancer is uh, on there, and uh, it was a fairly recent publication in twenty twenty two. And essentially, they kind of are, are um, really telling us what kind of biomarker we should be doing. So biomarker testing is essentially molecular testing that you do on um, on your uh, on your tumor. So essentially at the surgery or on biopsy, when you have the tumor, um, the tissue, they can run extra tests, mole usually molecular tests, um, to analyze different markers. And these markers do inform not only the prognosis, so how well or not well we 
think our therapies will work, but also it allows us to um, look for targeted therapy. So certain of these um, biomarkers are what we call actionable, meaning that there are drugs against these mutations. Not all biomarkers are actionable, so there's a difference. There are certain biomarkers that we simply have not developed a drug against it. Um, but again, as I said, usually the ones that are the minimum standard of care are the ones that are actionable and it will actually change our clinical practice today in clinic. So this is kind of the list, and we'll go through them briefly one by one. So the first big one, um, and the one I think we're all very, uh, we're the most familiar with, is something called microsatellite instability. Okay, and it's uh, number three. Um, and essentially, if you, uh, you can read right down here, is that essentially what it allows us to assess is whether or not we think you will respond to immunotherapy. So although we talk a lot about chemotherapy when it comes to uh, colorectal cancer treatment, know that there's a minority of patients who actually have microsatellite instability who will preferentially respond to a different kind of systemic therapy called immune therapy. Not everyone will respond to it, but in about 15% of cases, we have microsatellite instability. Now, microsatellite instability, so pembrolizumab is a immune, um, it's um, an immunotherapy. So essentially what it does um, briefly is that chemotherapy, I kind of say it's like a, it's like a, um, it's a soldier. It, it kind of directly goes to the cancer and it kills the cancer cell directly. Um, immunotherapy is more like a spy, okay? So what it does is that it kind of goes in the background, activates your immune system, and then uses your own immune system to attack um, to attack the cancer. Now, it's, it's a very nice concept, but know that it only works in certain cases when um, the, the uh, colon cancer are what we call microsatellite unstable. So um, this is kind of the study that um, showed that immunotherapy, so in this case called pembrolizumab, was better than chemotherapy. I apologize, it's in French. This is based on our own provincial recommendation here in Quebec. But based on this trial, essentially know that we do have access uh, across Canada to pembrolizumab in first line. Um, it will be approved for a total of two years because the study was um, designed to run for two years in total. Afterwards, um, usually we stop the immunotherapy. Um, then, um, you know, just to review a little bit, I apologize, I, this is a bit out of order, but microsatellite instability, what it does is that it plays a role in DNA repair. So essentially in our lifetime, our DNA are always being damaged, whether by the sun, rays, et cetera, aging. And we have a lot of mechanisms to try to repair this DNA. And when we have microsatellite issues is that this whole repair mechanism is broken and you develop a whole bunch of different mutations. And this is what makes it sensitive to immunotherapy. Now, we associate microsatellite instability a lot with a genetic mutation called Lynch syndrome. But know that Lynch syndrome, which is hereditary uh, colorectal cancer uh, syndrome, is a minority of, of the cases. Actually, most cases of microsatellite instability is actually acquired, meaning you did not inherit it from your mom or your dad, you just acquired it during a lifetime. So although um, a lot of times, you know, sometimes I hear patients go, well, I'm 80, I don't, I like, why am I doing this? pseudo quote unquote genetic tests, I don't think it's a hereditary issue, actually know that a lot of these um, mutations are actually acquired in a lifetime. And so this is really something that should be tested across the board. And I would argue get tested even in earlier, um, in earlier colon cancers. This was kind of exciting. I thought I would share it with you. Um, this is a study that was just shown in February of 2024 in San Francisco at the ASCO GI Symposium, where they looked at not just one immunotherapy, but two immunotherapies together, okay? So nivolumab is kind of another immunotherapy. It's a, it pretty much is the same as pembrolizumab. Please don't quote me on that. Um, but um, uh, essentially what they compared it with one immunotherapy versus two immunotherapies together versus chemotherapy. Okay, and not to belabor the point, but look at these curves. I don't think you need to be a statistician or mathematician to see how, how much better these patients do with double immunotherapy compared to chemotherapy alone.
Okay, so this was very exciting to us. And these are what we call subgroup analysis, where they kind of break it down um, in different subgroups, depending on age, on sex, on, you know, whether or not it's in the liver, in the lungs, you know, and it just goes down this grocery list, but all to say that it really does favor immunotherapy. Now, there is a price to pay, however, when we give two immunotherapies instead of one. I think anybody who does um, uh, oncology knows that, and we always are a little bit fearful of dual immunotherapies because we do know that although not high, this is where we can sometimes have immune adverse events, where when we stimulate our, our your a patient's immune system, it then goes and attacks good organs. If it's a thyroid, you can imagine it's not too, too bad, but imagine if it were to attack the heart or the lungs or even the brain. And so these are not benign treatments. And when I do start them, I am, a, you know, I, I very clearly state that you have about 90% chance of developing a side effect. And you can, there are, in most trials, there have been some death directly related to um, the immunotherapy per se. It is always a give and take, okay? Obviously, the curves are very, very nice. You can see that they do do very well, but know that this is a toxic treatment as well. And so, you know, to be careful with that too. And this is a discussion that needs to be absolutely had with your oncologist before uh, starting something like a dual immunotherapy. That being said, I'm a little bit in advance of my time because this is not approved yet, okay? This just came out in February. It has not gotten regulatory approvals, but this is something that I can anticipate happening in um, in a near future. Um, so let's just go ahead, skip ahead. So you know, microsatellite unstable colon cancer represents about fifteen percent of our cases, and know that you know there's a whole bunch of other trials, although none running in Canada right now, looking at different combinations, whether it's chemo and immuno double immuno, as I just said, and even in earlier stage. So everything I mentioned here was in later stage colon cancer, but even in earlier stage, what if you do have a microsatellite and stable colon cancer and you know a stage three, and right now what we have to offer is chemotherapy. Well, logically you're like, well, in the stage four, immunotherapy does better. So why would I go through chemotherapy? That's a very valid question. And obviously these are questions that we're kind of doing the trials right now. We just don't have the answer yet. And this is kind of a gross realist of what's out there. So know that there's a lot of interest in immunotherapy. Um, so I would highly encourage you if you do have um, a microsatellite unstable tumor to at least uh, ask, okay, about these trials. Now, BRAF mutation is number two here. BRAF is another um, a bit rare mutation. It's present in about 5% of cases uh, to 10, depending on the presentation. And essentially BRAF, um, um, it's, it has many, many different kinds of mutations. You have to be very, very careful. The numbers matter here, okay? So when we talk about BRAF mutations in colon cancer, specifically when it comes to drug access, it's really very much this set of numbers, okay? It is the most common. Luckily, it's the most common mutation, but it does matter if you have V600E versus a V600K versus a V600G. These are different point mutations. I'm not saying that these drugs don't work, but the approval in the trial has very much been made on BRAF V600E. And um, as it stands, we do have, again, targeted therapies. We do biomarkers when there are drugs available. We mandate biomarkers when there's drugs available against these mutations, right? So V600E, we do have access to it. I'm kind of proud to say Quebec was one of the first provinces in Canada to give um, to reimburse it. Okay, so we've had access to it here since August of 2022. And I think uh, six months later, Ontario followed suite. But essentially, we have targeted therapies against BRAF V600E in the second line setting meaning that um, the way that patients with BRAF E600E are treated right now is that you go through your first line of chemotherapy. If and when that chemotherapy stops working, then we have access to um, these targeted therapies. Um, in the first line setting, oftentimes, um, uh, as I said, uh, your oncologist will be proposing chemotherapy. Um, usually, we will combine it with something called a vaccine, okay? Because um, panitumumab, which I heard being bandied around um, in in the chat room, is not um, very um, uh, active when you have the BRAF, BRAF 600E mutation. 
I don't want to belabor the point too much, but essentially it is considered a little bit of a more aggressive um, subtype of colon cancer. So it would, uh, and although there are no solid data looking at two versus three chemotherapy agents altogether, know that oftentimes you might hear um, your oncologist propose something like um, a triplet chemotherapy, um, especially because the response rate is a little bit better, but obviously a little bit more toxic. Okay, so I'm going to skip through this at interest of time as well. Note that v BRAF, to make things more complicated, BRAF can exist with um, something called microsatellite instability, okay? So just because you have microsatellite instability, you can have both together. And so in those cases, know that um, if you do have the BRAF and the microsatellite instability, um, oftentimes we'll start with the immunotherapy because we have access right to immunotherapy in first line. And then if and when the immunotherapy stops working, then we can move on and use the, the uh, combination targeted um, against BRAF. Okay. So again, there are upcoming trials. Um, and again, in BRAF mutated cancers, um, uh, although a lot of the trials have been running in the second line, that's where we have access to. Know that across Canada, we have a study called Breakwater. Um, the Jewish is participating in it, where we're looking at um, these targeted therapies in first line. And there's been more recently an NSABP trial that is coming that just started opening, looking at targeted therapies in earlier stage colon cancer. So you can see kind of the theme going on here. The last one I wanted to mention very, very quickly is um, the RAS mutations because it does affect our access to a drug called panitumumab. Now, um, the story of panitumumab actually started in later lines of treatment where most cancer drugs start, right? So the newer drugs are always tested in kind of later lines, in this case, in third plus line. So you had at least two different kinds of systemic therapies before. And then in third line, um, they kind of looked at panitumumab, which is an anti-EGFR. And what was clearly shown here is that if you have a RAS mutation, it didn't do much. You can see the curves kind of squished together. But if you have, if you did not have a RAS mutation, what we call wild type, meaning that it is not mutated, you can see the curves separate here. And it is based on that again. And I apologize, it's again in French. Um, they don't translate it, by the way. We don't have an English version of these approvals. Okay, this is Quebec, um, but it's essentially in Quebec. It just to translate, it is approved in third line. So after two different kinds of systemic therapies in patients who do not have a RAS mutation. It could be KRAS or it could be NRAS. Um, now, there are two on the market available in Canada. So sometimes depending on which centers you work at, um, some, one or the other is available. Know that regardless, they are shown to be pretty much very similar. Okay. Um, so there's panitumumab and there's cetuximab on the market available here in Canada. But I'm sorry, Dr. Ma, I just feel compelled to interrupt. I'm, I'm very, very sorry. Absolutely. But will that, might that change in light of the new recommendation that has just come down the pipe, <laughs> the pipeline from, so. from Canada? I really, really think so. So essentially um, what has been happening and why it was so patchy across Canada is that access to first line anti-GFR was a little bit controversial and a little bit difficult. The reason being that it was not based on what we call prospective trials, meaning that we hadn't designed a trial to look at that question specifically when your RAS wild type, do you benefit more from panitumumab or Avastin? So it was based a lot on retrospective post hoc analysis of these really, really, really big phase three. So we're talking about thousands and thousands of patients. And across all these different thousands of patients, these studies, we consistently saw the benefit of uh, panitumumab or anti-GFR in patients who are RAS wild type, but it was not based on prospective studies. So essentially the way that reimbursement worked before the latest um, trial, which came out just last year, is that you had to have obviously RAS wild type, but um, essentially because it was not based on prospective data, you had to have what we called a contraindication to Avastin. Okay, so Avastin is an anti-vascular agent and things like um, 
uh, and it can cause things like bleeding, bowel perforation, or really bad hypertension. And so these were things that, you know, we would kind of write on our requisitions to try to get access to it. The problem is that people kind of looked at this and kind of took it as they wanted to take it. So there were certain centers that really believed in this. And so they would just very easily give it away. Other centers, you really had to have an overt you know, GI bleed requiring almost transfusions before they accept it to reimburse it. Okay, so that's why where it became very uneven across, um, I would say even across centers in the same province in Quebec. So there are certain centers that we did not have access to it. We had to do all this ring a mole and other centers that were just kind of freely giving it away. And so this is where the paradigm trial came on. And that was very, very helpful um, uh, to kind of finally close the book on this controversy. And so this is the prospective trial, meaning that they really looked specifically at comparing anti-EGFR panitumumab versus uh, avacin or bevacizumab with the usual chemotherapy, okay? And not to belabor the point, but you can clearly see here if you are RAS wild type, um, um, you benefited more from panitumumab rather than Avastin. And so this was the, the big prospective trial. I think we are all super relieved to finally have gotten our hands on. And this is um, the trial that allowed um, the company to kind of go back and to get regulatory approval um, to um, uh, at Cadet for access in first line, left-sided, wild-type RAS. <laughs> what <laughs> rad wild type colon cancer it's a mouthful but um so i'm very happy to say that based on this we now have um at least in quebec where reimbursement was a little bit patchy now kind of the centers have kind of rallied and with the uh, um the positive cadith um recommendation now i think you know it's kindly at least in our province has finally closed the book on on this on this uh, huge issue that was causing a lot of i i would say distress um on both ends and patients and um clinicians who truly thought that we were underserving patients where we could not have get a hold of these drugs in the first line so that that was a 2023 success story yeah uh, so um, again, I just wanted to close the talk just very, very briefly. You'll see again. So RAS, you know, I said, oh, we do biomarker testing for drug access because there's actionable mutation. Know that RAS per se in colon cancer is mainly um, to have access to panitumumab when it is not mutated because um, for a long time, we thought that RAS was not a uh, targetable mutation for all sort of chemical biochemical reasons we we couldn't develop a drug against the ras mutation per se and then finally they came up with a drug against very specific and again numbers and letters do count here okay so um, we are looking more and more into ras g12c mutations you'll see it in lung cancer is where they've kind of gotten the furthest in terms of um their trials and regulatory approvals, but note that KRAS G12C is also present in colon cancer. And um, very briefly, again, um, this was shown in October of 2023, where um, they in KRAS G12C mutated colon cancer. They developed this drug called Sotorasib, which is a um, antibody against KRAS G12C. They combined it with anti-EGFR, so panitumumab, and they compared it to um, standard chemotherapy. And as you can see here, although modest, okay, there is a benefit of targeted therapy uh, compared to standard third-line chemotherapy. Now, this, I have to say, has not gotten any regulatory approvals yet, so this is not something that we would easily have access to. Um, I know that um, currently as it stands, um, I'm still waiting. I I, um, I wrote a letter to Health Canada to try to get a hold of this drug for a patient, so I'll be very curious to see how this goes through as it is not currently marketed for this indication in Canada. Um, now, I kind of very briefly went through, again, the minimum standard biomarker, okay? So KRAS and RAS, why? Because if they're not mutated, we have access now to panitumumab in first line. BRAF, why? Because in first line, we don't want to use panitumumab. We want to use um, uh, Avastin. And in second line, we have targeted agents towards it. 
And now we also have clinical trials, okay? Looking at BRAF mutated and um, microsatellite, why do we care? Because of access to immunotherapy, okay? So this is kind of the standard, what everyone should be getting regardless of where you're being treated, whether it's in a community or an academic center, this is kind of the bottom minimum necessary. Now, there are obviously more biomarkers, and you know this is just a couple of them, but know that there is a million more out there. Why? Because mainly um, there are clinical trials and drugs that are being developed actively against these mutations. Okay, so this is kind of my wrap up. Again, in early stage colon cancer, I think a lot of the um, effort right now is kind of trying to better identify patients who will actually need chemotherapy. Because I think we all agree, if you don't need chemotherapy, I don't want chemotherapy. I wouldn't want chemotherapy. However, we do not want to under-treat patients either. So that if we can, you know, I better identify, and ctDNA is one of those kind of hot new topics, to better identify patients who will actually benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. I think we'll avoid unnecessary chemotherapy in many um, patients with earlier stage colon cancer. Advanced colon cancer, I think the name of the game is biomarker testing currently. And again, um, I, I do encourage uh, you to familiarize yourself or at least ask your oncologist whether or not the must do tests have been done based on the Canadian guidelines. And obviously more extensive panels are always um, a nice thing to get, especially if um, participate for participation in clinical trials. And here um, I'm just putting the clinical trial, um, the Canadian clinical trial group website, as well as um, there's an actually, this one has, <laughs> has a version in English. This is the Quebec um, oncology group. So these are the kind of the active clinical trials and you can navigate it according to your um, tumor site. And on that note, I hope yeah. that it was not too, too confusing mm -hmm. <laughs> um, of a topic and uh, feel free to ask any questions. Yeah, if we could just uh, exit presentation mode so that uh, our share. members Maybe have an opportunity. Share. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have questions for Dr. Ma? And Philomena, would you like to just pause the recording for the Q&A session? Sure. And we'll restart it. I had a question for Dr. Ma. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start out by. Here. Okay. Uh, so next, we are so very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Gonzalo Saposochin, who is the staff surgeon at the Toronto General Hospital at the University Health Network in Toronto. Um, Dr. Saposochin received his medical diploma in 2005 in Madrid and then went on to complete his general surgery residency training in 2011 in Barcelona, where he successfully defended his doctoral thesis on the optimization of liver transplant transplantation for hepatocellular carcinoma uh, to receive his PhD. Uh, he then went on to complete his clinical fellowship in abdominal transplant and HPV surgical oncology with the University of Toronto and was subsequently recruited in a position at TGH as staff surgeon with the multi-organ transplant program and the division of surgery, uh, general surgery. Uh, he is an associate professor of surgery at the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Sapi Sochin's main research interest is the interface between liver transplantation and cancer. Uh, he has been one of the drivers of the concept of transplant oncology and chaired a consensus conference in this topic. Uh, he has focused his research in the management of hepatocellular carcinoma, cholangiocarcinoma, and of course, colorectal liver metastases. Uh, he has published more than 150 original man manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals, uh, and I will pass it over to Philomena to add to that. <laughs> Where do I even begin? Okay, so Cran has had the privilege of working with Dr. Sapi Soshin for a number of years. And in that time, I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that he has proven himself to be the consummate professional and patient advocate when it comes to the surgical management of colorectal liver metastases. He is, a, he is an absolute blessing to anyone who is lucky enough to cross his path. And I 
we at CRAN are blessed to have him as our mentor, as our go-to clinician, as our ally on behalf of colorectal cancer, liver, METS patient population across Canada. He keeps me grounded, <laughs> he keeps me honest, and he keeps me passionate when it comes to assisting our colorectal liver metastases patient population. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Gonzalo Safisoshin? Hello, everyone. <laughs> it's great to be here. Hi, Philomena. Uh, it's good to see some familiar faces. Thanks uh, so much for those were incredible words. And it's a, a real pleasure to be, you know, with all of you here today. So thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, it's been certainly a pleasure to work uh, with Philomena and her team for the last, uh, I don't know, many, many years and more to come, I hope so. So I'm going to see if I can, I guess, share my screen. Can, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, I think you can. And that's uh, my slides. So what I wanted to talk today about is the surgical management of colorectal liver metastasis. And I'll talk about, you know, in general, um, you know, how we think about the surgical management, what's the importance of the surgical management. I'll talk a little bit about some techniques that we can do to, you know, to basically increase the number of patients we can resect uh, uh, colorectal metastasis. And then I'll talk a little bit also about transplant for colorectal metastasis, which is something that we've pioneered, at least in Canada and North America, and, and that it's kind of moving pretty quickly and, uh, you know, being offered to many patients. So these are my disclosures. So this is a bit of a older slide, but, you know, still is similar to what we see uh, today. This is uh, from the US, but you know, okay, you know, if you look at the cases of, of colorectal metastases and you look at the patients that are gonna develop uh, colorectal metastases, we know that 50% are gonna develop colorectal metastases at any point, some metachronicus, some are synchronous disease. And then of those, you know, 50% are gonna have liver only disease. And then, you know, I'll, I'll show you in a minute that not every patient is eligible for surgery for for about for several reasons and you know when when we look at basically cases where like these where where patients have bilobar colorectal liver metastasis you know there's challenges both from an oncological standpoint and obviously from a technical standpoint right it's very different to have you know patients that have one or two small metastases in one lobe where you know, there's really no discussion of what the management should be and the management should be surgical resection. And a case like this where you know, we need to figure out how we're gonna offer uh, a patient a, a potentially curative option with a combination of, of chemotherapy and, and surgery. And when we think about you know, resection, there's you know, many things we need to talk about, right? Or we need to think about. One is the medical condition of the patient. And you know, we look at the patient from a, uh, you know, how good or not the patient is, ECOG status, you know, other comorbidities, et cetera, and, and, and symptoms, et cetera. Obviously there's oncological criteria, right? If there's disease outside of the liver, how, you know, how much disease there is outside of the liver. We have biomarkers. I mean, CA is the one we commonly use. Now there's a lot of, new data with circulating tumor DNA, which probably in the next years will be a better biomarker, you know, obviously response to chemo. And then, you know, you just heard a, a talk, I guess I, I got there at the end, but I was hearing about KRAS, but obviously, you know, molecular profile and genetics of, of colorectal metastasis or colorectal cancer is important. And obviously as a surgeon, there's certain technical aspects that we need to take into account when we think about surgery. And, you know, the liver is, uh, you know, even though there's been a lot of uh, propaganda, I would say, about how important the heart is, actually, the liver is probably way more important than the heart. Like you can live with a, you know, with a heart that's not working and you can be connected to a pump. But if your liver doesn't work, there's no pump, actually. So if your liver doesn't work and your liver, uh, you know, is, is full of disease, actually, that's, you won't, you know, patients won't survive this. And the liver is also the only organ that uh, regenerates. And I'll show you some actually funny facts um, that maybe some of you may know, but some may not about, about the liver. But the only limited factor is 
to basically leave enough liver behind. So we need to leave at least 25% of the liver behind if we're doing a liver resection, but we can actually resect some patients where we resect 70 to 75% of the liver. And we basically need to leave enough volume that there is enough outflow of blood, enough inflow, enough inflow of blood and adequate you know, drainage of, of bile from the liver. And, you know, as I was saying, you know, regeneration of the liver is something that has been known since the Greeks. And it's actually something I can't get my head around, but this is the myth, uh, you know, this is Prometheus. And Prometheus was, you know, kind of uh, his, uh, he was punished to be attached to a rock and an eagle would come and eat his liver every night because they already knew that the liver would regenerate, which, you know, it's kind of puzzling to me how they knew that but they did know that and since then we've known that the liver is the only organ in the body that is able to regenerate and with that there's a lot of things we can do with the liver so this is uh, as i was saying you know when we look at patients that have you know colorectal metastasis by lower or not there's a lot of things that we can do and if you look to the left of your screen you know if you have peripheral metastasis in the liver we can go in and do what is it's down there called PSH, which means parenchymal sparing operations, where or hepatectomies, which in Europe is called the swish teeth technique, where you go in the liver and you make you know holes and you're able to resect all the metastases. You can also combine, you know, resecting some metastases and then resecting one of the lobes of the liver. When the tumors are more in the center of the liver, then we'll we're talking about more complicated operations like two-stage hepatectomy that I'll show you in a minute. You can combine resections with ablations. You know, there's potential to do uh, some therapies uh, like uh, hepatic artery infusion pump. And we'll talk obviously in this population, uh, which is a population where transplant plays, plays an important role in my opinion. And then as I, you know, we'll talk also about some techniques like the ALPS procedure, which is a kind of a more advanced liver uh, surgery that we can do. So this is what we call a two-stage uh, hepatectomy where patients have you know, metastasis in both lobes, but they're operable. So what we do is that we take some of the tumors from the left side of the liver, as you can see in the first stage, and then we do what says their PVE, which is a portal vein embolization. We embolize the right side of the portal vein that makes the, you know, the left liver shrink, but what's more important is, sorry, the right liver shrink, but what's more important is that the left liver gets all the flow and it grows, and then we can actually go in and remove the right lobe safely and leave the patient with enough, what we call FLR, and with, it's a, enough future liver remnants, so enough liver behind for the patient to survive. This is what we call parenchymal sparing operations, or what I said in Europe, we call switch cheese technique, where again, that's the liver and we make holes in the liver and we can remove all these metastases. And, you know, we've done operations like this when we've removed like 15 tumors uh, from the liver and you leave your left parenchyma because basically what you're doing is making holes all around the liver. And that's something we do pretty frequently. And, and, and it's important to do this because if, if a patient is going to recur in the liver, you want to leave a much liver behind so you can go back and reoperate and maybe reoperate. And actually there's quite a bit of data, you know, in the last years that, you know, you can do that in many patients, but to do that, you need to do this parenchymal sparing technique. So uh, it's recommended actually not to remove whole lobes, but, you know, to do these techniques in, 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 in with that, the idea that you can do further, you know, surgery in the future. As you, you know, we talked about briefly, but the only potential for cure for patients that have, you know, metastatic disease to the liver is the combination of surgery and chemotherapy. Uh, but unfortunately, a minority of patients are actually candidates for surgery. If you are able to resect patients with stage four colon cancer with disease only, only in the liver, actually, the overall survival and median survival is pretty good for patients with stage four colon cancer as this data shows. And I'm not gonna repeat this because I've, I've already uh, said this. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about ways to increase uh, the future liver remnant. As I said, you know, you need to have at least 25% of your liver. Uh, and, and many of these, many patients uh, do have quite a bit of chemotherapy ahead of time. So sometimes we actually need to leave even more liver, more like 30, 35%, given the, that the, as many as you know, the chemotherapy is, is toxic to the liver. So ALPSIS stands for Associated Liver Partition and Portal Vein Ligation for Stage Hepatectomy. And I'll show you uh, what we do with this technique. So this is a small video 
where what we do is, you know, this is a patient that had a very large tumor in the right side of the liver. And what we do is that we transect the liver basically in half or not in half in this, actually in this plane where, we're, you know, the right side of the liver is what, sorry, the right side of your screen is what the liver, the future liver remnant. We take all the branches going to the right of the liver. So this is what this video is showing where ligating all these branches. So all the flow goes to that small part of the liver. That's what the patient will, will be left with. And what this does, and we preserve, that's showing that we preserve the artery, the portal vein and the hepatic veins that are draining the liver. And what this does is that the liver grows very quickly and grows a lot. Uh, and then, you know, this is an example of a patient that had probably 15% left in the liver. And when we did this technique, the liver grew to probably like 30, 40%. And then we go back and leave that, you know, piece of the left lobe that has really grown and we're able to remove all the right side as this kind of diagram is shown. This obviously, this is a pretty complex technique that, you know, has had, you know, some criticism when it's done in smaller centers with smaller volume. Uh, you know, we've done several cases um, and, uh, you know, it can be done safely, but I think it's important to understand that these are pretty large procedures that should be done in pretty specialized centers. This is a basically, you know, what it's showing is, you know, that the different if you resect just the right lobe, you're resecting 60 to 70%. If you resect the right lobe plus, sorry, plus part of the left lobe, you're resecting 70 to 90% of the liver, which is what that diagram was showing where you're leaving only 10 to 15% of the liver. And that's where Alps uh, may play a role. And these are ways, as I said, of, I'm, I'm kind of repeating what I was mentioning of ways to augment your future liver remnant. One is to do this portal vein embolization, uh, the other way is to do this, you know, two-stage hepatectomy and then ALPS, as I, as I just showed you. And this is just a diagram that really shows the differences in growth. So if you look at the different axes, like on the left of your screen is how fast the liver grows in days. So in the bottom line is days since you do the first operation or the portal vein embolization and how fast the liver grows if you're doing ALPS or if you're doing a portal vein embolization on the right of your screen. And it's actually incredible. Like when you do these ALPS procedures, you know, you can take the patients that have a, the future liver remnant was only like 10 or 15% and a week to 10 days later, it becomes 35%. While with a portal vein embolization, sorry, this sometimes takes up to two months. So the growth is really, really quick. Uh, the indications for ALPS are basically, you know, this is, was a registry that was published some years ago, but this is mainly for colorectal metastasis. So this is for the population we were basically talking about. You can do it with primary tumors, but it's less, it's, you know, it's less indicated. Actually, the, the kind of the best case for an ALPS procedure is patients that have synchronous disease where the primary tumor is inside you, where you can go inside and in the first stage where you're partitioning the liver, you take the primary tumor out. And then a week to two weeks later, you know, the liver has grown after that partition and you take, you know, the rest of the right lobe out. Um, and, you know, the patient can be disease free in, you know, two or three weeks after the first stage. This is just some data comparing, actually, this was the Ligra. This is one of the only randomized trials that compared portal vein embolization with ALPS. And basically what it showed is that there was a increase in the resectability. So more patients could be resected uh, from their liver metastasis is you did an ALPS procedure than if you did a portal vein embolization. And I'm just gonna, I don't wanna bother you with data. So I'm gonna uh, pass all the data, but again, maybe this is an interesting figure where, you know, ALPS is, on the, is the blue line and TSH is two-stage hepatectomy. So this portal vein embolization, which is the classic technique that had been done. And as you can see, the overall survival with ALPS is higher. And the only reason is because there's more patients you can actually operate on. And as we know, you know, surgery, the combination of surgery and chemotherapy is the only potential for cure. And that's why if you're able to offer, you know, a techniques where you can operate on patients, the outcomes are better. And that's the only reason. And again, I'm just going to pass hold it because I think it's a lot of, it's a lot of data. As I said, you know, we have quite a bit of experience at UHN uh, with ALPS procedures. And this is just an example of a patient 
that was you know 30 years old with a left lobe uh, left colon cancer and by lower liver metastasis deemed un unresectable in uh, other centers and as you can see I don't know if you see my pointer but only the left lateral segment of the liver was free of, of liver metastasis uh, and you know the FLR the future liver remnant was only 10 percent and as I said you know, we usually need around 25 to 30% to be able to operate on a patient. And as you can see, look at how, you know, this just, this is just to show you how the liver regenerates. So this is this small piece of liver that, you know, sometime later has become this very large uh, piece of liver. I mean, this patient underwent other treatments afterwards, but uh, she was able to undergo, you know, this uh, very large operation just because we were able to augment the liver. Uh, thanks for, you know, the, the capacity of the liver to regenerate. So I'm, you know, now going to move, uh, you know, to kind of the last part of, of my talk, and I'm going to focus a little bit on, on liver transplantation for a patient with bilobar non-resectable colorectal liver metastasis, and hopefully uh, it won't be too long, and then we'll have a lot of opportunity for questions. Um, so, you know, transplant oncology is something that we've been working on uh, for many years, and you know, I think uh, very kindly Cassandra was able to explain in the in the introduction that I've been kind of pioneering this concept, uh, you know, uh, in many places around the world. And this concept of transplant oncology obviously is the you know the opportunity to treat some patients with cancer uh, with a liver transplant. But there's other you know, and that's kind of one of the pillars. That's the one on the top that says evolution of multidisciplinary cancer care. This is treating again, as I said, patients with cancer with a liver transplant. There's another kind of you know interesting surgical um, uh, pillar, which is the extension of the traditional margins of surgical oncology. You know, ALPS is a good example. So this combination of of, of surgical techniques of transplant and hepatobiliary surgery gives us some you know, uh, techniques that we can combine and, and it expands the way some of these patients can undergo surgery. And then there's other interesting, more, I would say, basic science concept like, you know, the use of immunotherapy before transplant and then after transplant, and then some looking at some genetic, uh, gen genetic me mechanisms look using these explanted livers, which for example, have, you know, 10 or 20 metastases that we can study and we can look at different alterations in the different metastases, it's a good platform to do that. And the reason, you know, there's a lot of uh, interest in this concept is because, you know, transplant is a very good technique uh, in terms of overall survival. And I think I have a figure of transplants in general. Like nowadays, the risk of, you know, surviving a liver transplant is obviously very high. And the survival at one year, five years and 10 years is actually very good. We've actually also learned that the organ availability, you know, is still a problem, but we're developing ways to increase the organ pool. You know, obviously, when you think about transplant and cancer, there's all this concept that, well, if you patients need to get immunosuppression to decrease the risk of rejection, and because you decrease the immune system, you know, you can increase the, the risk of the cancer coming back. But we've learned more and more to manage this, and we are able to give less immunosuppression to patients with cancer. Obviously, there's been huge improvements in systemic therapies for many different cancers in the last 10 years. And if we talk about, uh, you know, hepat like hepatocerous carcinoma, biliary cancer, which I know is not the topic of this of this uh, talk today, but there's a massive revolution in that in that uh, in that treatments in the last you know three to five years. It's been a complete revolution. And then this is just to explain you that you know, in the past, we used to transplant most patients with hepatitis C that had decompensated and cirrhosis, and now there's drugs that cure hepatitis C, so we don't see hepatitis C patients anymore. So the idea of which patients need a transplant or no is really changing. This is the slide I wanted to show you. So this is data from our own transplant program, and this is not for patients with colorectal liver metastasis. This is for transplant in general, for every indication. But as you can see, the outcomes are exceptional, right? Like we're talking about five, you know, one, five and 10 year survival, you know, 95, 84 and 75 for living donation and, you know, pretty similar for disease donors. So it's a very safe procedure. Like we've been doing transplants, you know, for many years at Toronto General and other programs, and now it's considered a pretty safe procedure. So, you know, liver transplant is still contraindicated in most centers. And the problem had been that in the past, 
you know, they had this had been tried many times and the outcomes were very poor. But obviously, you know, this was tried in the 90s and the, and the 90s and the chemo regimens obviously have changed a lot since then. This is data from the first kind of studies of transplant for colorectal metastasis. And as you can see, the five year survival was pretty poor. However, you know, this group in, in Oslo, in Norway, uh, now many years ago, I guess this, this paper is from 2013, so I guess 11 years ago, you know, published this first series with 21 patients transplanted, where, as you can see, the five-year survival of these patients was around 60%. However, most of the patients did develop recurrence, but then they were very, very aggressive in treating some of the recurrences post-transplant. When we, and then with this story, they, they developed, and, and this is important because I'll show you some interesting data with this Oslo score, this Oslo score that shows certain characteristics that are risk factors for, for worst outcomes. So if the tumors are very large, more than 5.5, if the CA is high, if the patients are not responding to chemo, or if the interval between transplant and, sorry, between the primary resection and the transplant is short, the outcomes are worse. And with this, you can create this Oslo score. And, and we'll try and remember this because I'll show you the outcomes of patients with low Oslo score, which are the ones that we actually are transplanting. When you look at the outcomes that they did comparing transplant with systemic chemotherapy, as you can see, not much difference in the progression-free survival, but huge differences in the overall survival if you are just treated with chemotherapy or if you can actually undergo a liver transplant. When these patients recur, actually, we see patterns of recurrence that are very similar to what we see when we do surgery for colorectal metastasis. Mainly, these patients recur in the lung. And usually, these lung metastases, as many of you know, are usually very slow growing. They can be operated and upon. I know Dr. Seipel will be talking to you guys later, and I'm sure he'll talk about this. But, you know, these metastases usually can be either controlled with radiation or can be controlled with surgery. And that's the main, the most frequent site of recurrence. And actually, as I was saying, once recurrence happens after transplant, you can operate on these patients and you can achieve good outcomes post-recurrence, post-transplant. You know, as, as many of you may know, like the, in Oslo, they had a pretty unique scenario where they had more livers than patients in the waiting list, which is not what happens uh, here in Ontario. And, and, and you know, they, they had a bit of a protocol that was not very standardized. However... And this is just a, a, a short slide. And I'll, I mean, just a slide, but I'll show you one just afterwards. In those patients with low Oslo score, as you can see, the number of patients here are pretty, pretty low, but you can see 50% 10-year survival on patients with low Oslo score with well-selected patients. This is when they you know, presented their second trial where they adjusted a little bit more their, their criteria. And again, small number of patients, but again, Overall survival, five-year overall survival over 80%. They've actually just published, uh, you know, at the end of uh, last year, their kind of long-term outcome of 61 patients. And I want you to focus on the overall survival because I think this is really remarkable. For all comers, for all the patients they've transplanted, they have a median overall survival over 60 months, which I think it's completely remarkable. Think about these are patients that the alternative would be systemic chemotherapy, basically. And I think more importantly, if you look at the patients with an Oslo score 0 and 2, and I, I want to be mindful that the number of patients is small, but most of the patients are Oslo score 0 and 2, the median overall survival is actually 90 months, which again, think about this. These are patients with bilobar colorectal metastasis when the only potential treatment is, chemo, is systemic chemotherapy. So, you know, the field is evolving and we're learning a lot that some of these patients actually can do remarkably well and actually some can actually be cured uh, with a liver transplant. There are many trials around the globe happening, many of them. I think the most interesting one is this trial from France. This is called the TransMed trial. And this was actually a randomized control trial where they randomized patients to chemo or chemo plus transplant. And the trial actually finalized accru accrual. And it's going to be probably reading in sometime in 2025 or 2026. But this will be an, a massive study because I think this is going to show completely separate curves with transplant or with systemic chemotherapy. We actually were the first 
programs to show in the world. This is a publication in JAMA Surgery that living donor liver transplant, which is what we've been doing in Toronto, is very safe and can have good outcomes in patients. And this was a combined publication between ourselves, Rochester and Cleveland Clinic. And actually, this is very timely because I think four days ago, uh, this publication was able to go into the Journal of Clinical Oncology, which I think is very important that the oncologists are starting to really learn about this. I was lucky enough to be probably, the, yeah, I think I was the first person to speak at GI ASCO uh, two years ago about this topic, and it generated a lot of discussion. And this is the first publication, again, from three or four days ago in JCO, it's a very short two pager, but it basically is showing oncologists when they should be referring these patients to transplant oncology centers. And I think this is very important because oncologists need to understand that this is an, an opportunity for patients. And we can talk about that. Philomena and I obviously talk about this with many, many patients, but I, I think groups like CRAN can really help to you know uh, uh, explain that this is a very good option for some patients. This is a little bit of how algorithms work. And I was lucky enough to participate in this kind of world guidelines of, of how to manage patients with um, metastatic colorectal cancer that may be candidates for, for transplantation. So, you know, if, if patients have extra hepatic disease, transplant is not an option. And I'll talk about inclusion and exclusion criteria in a minute. If patients have, they don't fulfill the molecular criteria, which is basically BRAF, B6, and RD patients, then they, they're not eligible for transplant. If they have synchronous disease, they first should undergo systemic chemotherapy to make sure that they are responding. And then, sorry, we can go ahead and remove the primary. And if they have metachronic disease, actually, they can be treated for at least six months as a bridge to transplant. And then all these patients can be transplanted, uh, as I'll show you some inclusion and exclusion criteria. There is even some thought about, you know, in patients that are marginally resectable. So I just showed you, you know, ALPS procedures two-stage hepatectomies, there is some thought that some of these patients may have more micrometastatic disease in the liver that we're not seeing. And there is some thought that maybe transplant may be better in the future. I don't think we're there yet. I think at this point, patients that are resectable should be resected, but who knows? I mean, I think the problem with these difficult resections when there's many multiple metastases is that there may be more micrometastatic disease in the liver that actually only a liver transplant will take care. So this is something that is starting to be questioned. I'm just going to move to our own uh, protocol and maybe I can show this video quickly if it works, but it, it looks like it's not working, so I'm not going to show it. These are our own, our, our main uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria for our protocol. So patients need to be under 68. They can't have disease outside of the liver. They have to be, their primary has to be resected at least six months before we evaluate them or we transplant them. And they have to be stable on chemotherapy for uh, six months. Currently, we're only doing living donor liver transplants, but we can talk. I mean, we're very advanced with the government to start including patients uh, in the waiting list. I think this may happen anytime now. We had a last meeting, I think two weeks ago, when this was approved now by Trillium Gift of Life Network. So we're going to start including patients in the waiting list. And I can talk about a little bit about this. And this is the main exclusion criteria, which is basically uh, disease outside of the liver, uh, BRAF, B6, and remutation, and, and progression on chemo. And this is a little bit how our protocol works. You know, patients get uh, assessed first. If their primary is in situ, as I said, we give them chemo for at least three months and then we offer them a primary resection and then they keep, you know, being uh, evaluated. They first need a transplant assessment where our transplant hepatologists, you know, evaluate if their heart, um, you know, heart, lungs and general health is enough to undergo a liver transplant, which usually these patients are. Then patients, once they're cleared, the donors can be assessed. Um, and we can talk about a little bit about the donors if you want at the time of questions. Then the patients undergo an expiratory laparotomy to make sure there's no nodes in the porta. And then a week later, they undergo a liver transplant. And, you know, I can announce, and I guess for some reason, this slide is not coming the way I want it because you can only see 10 patients here, right? Um, in yeah. the slide, for some reason, I'm sorry. We've actually done 12 patients. So I'm sorry that this slide came this way, but uh, I can, you know, I can say that we've done 12 patients of them. Uh, most of them have done very well. Um, one of our patients did recur, did recur in the lungs pretty quickly after a transplant. And this was probably persistent disease and not a new disease. If you look back, these were probably nodes that were there that were very small. 
Unfortunately, one of our very loved patients that uh, Philomena knew very well, you know, passed away uh, for reasons probably unrelated to the cancer, or at least there was no evidence of, of uh, cancer recurrence for reasons that we're still uh, are unclear almost five years after transplant. And we have another patient that did recur um, a year and a half after transplant is currently on chemotherapy and has some nodes that will likely be resected. The other, I guess, nine patients are actually doing very well. Uh, there's a combination between, you know, three years follow-up, two years follow-up, some under a year of follow-up, uh, but currently doing, doing well. And I think this is just to point out that every patient we've transplanted has this Oslo score between zero and two. So this is what we're aiming is for a median survival of 90 months, right? But that's what we're really aiming when we're offering transplant to our patients. Um, and I just wanted to show you one of our cases because this is something that we see a lot. We work actually pretty closely with the group in Sunnybrook. Uh, they see a lot of the patients um, with bilobar colorectal metastasis for hepatic artery infusion pump. And this was a, at the time 37 year old patient with a sigmoid cancer, a very high CA, as you can see, KRAS, IBRAF, wild type, MSS, had a lot of systemic chemotherapy. And uh, then a, a pump was placed. And as you can see, 20 months later, you know, the disease was quote unquote, almost gone. And I think that's important because there's very good response to chemo. However, uh, as I'll show you in a minute, we need to be careful about this, what is gone radiologically and what is really gone. And this is the explanted liver. Right now, this patient is doing very well, uh, almost two and a half years out of her transplant. And as you can see, many of those little spots that were called no disease in the, in the radiology pre-transplant and on the scans in the PET has actually were patients that had disease. So I think we need to be careful about the correlation between scans and what is really, you know, complete response at the pathological level. And we've actually transplanted four patients that had a pump before and all of them had viable disease. So the pump seems like a very good treatment as a bridge, but probably is unlikely that this is going to be curative uh, because all of these patients have actually uh, tumor in their, in their explant. This is just to show you that guidelines are starting to move. These are guidelines you know, Nature Gastro is a very high impact journal that are already including transplant in some of their algorithms. And I will just, you know, finish that, you know, aggressive surgical approaches for colorectal liver metastasis are definitely feasible. And patients with colorectal liver metastasis should actually be seen by hepatobiliary surgeons, in my opinion, from the get-go, as soon as they're diagnosed, uh, because that's the best way, uh, you know, to keep uh, you know, that they're seen from the beginning, they can have an assessment at the beginning, they can decide if they need chemo or not, but the patibulary surgeon needs to be involved from the beginning. You know, liver transplant, I think it's a very good option and the data we have is getting better and better. There's going to be some white paper coming from the American Society of Transplant Surgeons and the American Hepatobiliary Association that Philomena was very involved with and uh, also some of our oncologists in Ontario. So this is becoming more of a standard of care slowly, not yet. And then, as I said, ALPS is a very, you know, complex technique that improves resectability and, you know, should be done in very, uh, you know, uh, in centers that have a lot of experience, probably with transplant experience too. And with this, this is uh, my lab and my group that helps me a lot with everything we do. And I would like to thank you all for your time. And I would be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Safi Soshan. Ladies and gentlemen, questions? <clears throat> I, I would have a question. <laughs> Hello. Uh, for the Oslo score, there was one of the part of the Oslo score was a treatment time or, or the discovery time of less than two, two years. Why was that being seen as a negative thing? Yeah, so so yeah, one of the factors was exactly that. So time from diagnosis of the of the colorectal cancer to the time of transplant, and and this is two years. Um, the reality, you know, in our own protocol. We have six months from the time of resection of the primary to transplant. The reality is that when we see these patients, most of most patients have already been diagnosed way before we see them. And the reality is that when you look at all the data from many, many, most of the centers, not every center weighs 24 months. I think 24 months, in my opinion, is too long, but most of the patients get transplanted 
around 15, a median of 15 months between the diagnosis of the colorectal cancer. Thank you. All right. Okay, so welcome, Dr. Saipel. Thank you so much for joining us, um, especially um, right after surgery and your busy day. Uh, we really appreciate you, you being here. Um, so um, for everybody uh, just coming back, so Dr. Saipel is a uh, staff a thoracic surgeon at UHN, University Health Network um, in Toronto, and a professor of surgery at the University of Toronto. Uh, he is the surgical director of the Ajmera Transplant Center at UHN and the Artificial Lung Program at UHN as well. He received his MD in 1999 and completed his general surgery and thoracic surgery residency program in 2004. In 2005, he started his postdoctoral research fellowship. Um, and during this time, he developed a new method of lung preservation and donor lung repair called ex vivo, EX vivo, lung, um, lung perfusion. And this new method is now used clinically in Toronto and in many other centers and has significantly increased the number of transplantable lungs. Uh, he subsequently performed a, a three-year fellowship in thoracic oncology, cardiac surgery, and lung transplantation at the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Saipel has a large number of first and senior author peer review publications, including high impact journals such as uh, Science Translational Medicine, the New England Journal of Medicine, and The Lancet. Uh, his main clinical interests are in artificial lung devices, ex vivo, and of course, in vivo lung perfusion, as well as lung transplantation. Uh, Dr. Saipel currently holds the prestigious Canada Research Chair in Lung Transplantation from the Government of Canada, and he is the principal investigator in uh, very innovative clinical trials, such as in vivo lung perfusion, which we will hear more about shortly. Um, and uh, he is also a member of the American Association for Thoracic Surgery and a fellow from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Um, so, Dr. Saipel, welcome. I will pass it over just briefly to Philomena to uh, to welcome you a little bit further. But we are so grateful for um, for your expert participation today. Uh, okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's because of Dr. Saipel's tireless efforts and meaningful work in respect of our colorectal lung meds patient population that my outlook has changed for the better with respect to our patients diagnosed with lung metastases. I cannot emphasize enough the important work that he is doing and the patient-centric manner in which it is being done. We are so privileged, so, so very privileged to have him speak to you today and privileged to have him as a valued member of the CRAN Medical Advisory Board. I am eternally grateful to him for improving patient outcomes, our patient outcomes in the colorectal cancer space. Won't you please, please join me in welcoming Dr. Marcelo Saipel. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Philomena Cassandra, for the kind introduction. I'm sorry for being a few minutes late. <clears throat> it's been a busy day at the end here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the, uh, you know, the management of lung metastasis, but more focus, of course, in colorectal, which is really um, the patient um, uh, that patients that I see the most uh, in, in our clinic here. Um, and the one that uh, we have uh, very interesting uh, studies um, that we hope are going to improve the, the outcomes. So um, one of the main questions uh, when you have pulmonary metastasis from colorectal cancer is, um, you know, our local therapy is going to be helpful. So once you have your primary tumor re removed, and then a lung lesion or several lung lesions develop, um, you know, should you 
you know, go to just chemotherapy or whether doing some <coughs> local treatment um, in the lung nodules can help. And we do believe and the data support that, uh, you know, doing surgery to remove the lesions or, you know, doing surgery uh, and radiation or just radiation does add substantial ability to control disease progression compared to chemotherapy alone. Um, the two most common uh, types of local modalities we use is surgery and SBRT. SBRT is stereotactic radiation. So it's a very high intensity radiation that goes in the lesion and it's much more eff efficacious than the other traditional conventional radiation approaches. Uh, ra radio frequency ablation, uh, we don't do that much in lung here um, in, in Canada. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is because uh, SBRT is more effective and also is less invasive. And so RFA, you have to put a needle inside your lung and then you give the ablation and there is substantial risk of some uh, complications that can occur uh, by hitting the lung uh, tissue uh, in that area. So those are the two modalities we use the most. Um, it's very important uh, when we evaluate the patients, what is the age and comorbidities. Um, I have to say uh, things have changed a lot for colorectal cancer. Um, I can say over the last five, six years, uh, we're seeing a lot of young patients with colorectal cancer that was different before. Before they typically would be in the 60s, 70s. Now we are seeing patients in the 30s, uh, 40s, uh, you know, many patients in that age. Um, and, um, and also what is very important here uh, as a prognostic factor is what we call the timeline of disease course. So what we call disease-free interval. So it's better, of course, um, if you have your primary cancer it's treated, and let's say three years later, you develop a lung nodule, is better prognosis than if you develop the lung nodule just like three months after having your diagnosis of colorectal cancer or having the, the lung diagnosis at the same time with the primary. Um, but even if that occurs, doesn't mean that there is no treatment, it's just one prognostic factor. Um, and then uh, we have to take in consideration the number of loc end location. So, you know, number is something important. We know patients that have more than, you know, four lesions and bilateral, they tend to do uh, worse uh, compared to less than four lesion. And then extra pulmonary disease is important as well. Going to discuss a little bit about that. Interestingly, in colorectal cancer, having liver metastasis doesn't adversely impact uh, patients that have lung metastasis and vice versa. So if you only have you know, lung metastasis or if you have lung and liver, uh, the chance of, of controlling the disease is very similar. So it's not a contraindication for surgery in the lungs if you have a liver lesion and it's not a contraindication for surgery in the liver if you have a lung lesions. Um, so that's an important uh, uh, concept because many other cancers, we wouldn't consider a more aggressive approach if you have disease in more than one site. So in selected patients, yes, it's important. We think surgery has several uh, advantages. Uh, it's a very well-established approach for pulmonary metastasis we can do today minimal invasive approaches with small cuts if you have a small number of lesions and uh, local recurrence at the resection si at the resection site is not common when you have good margins and it can provide long-term survival um, and also provide tissue diagnosis and uh, you can look at uh, mutation and so other markers as well. Um, of course, uh, surgery is not perfect, so you can have some complications related to that, such as prolonged pain. 
Uh, you could have a local recurrence at the site of resection. Uh, the estimation number for that is about 10 to 20 percent. Um, um, that's right where you resected, the cancer cells could come back in that location. I'm not talking about other parts of the lung. Um, um, then uh, you could have pleural dissemination and you could have also loss of function when you have to resect larger parts of the lungs. Uh, so this is again, just to show an example here, uh, this is a, a local failure from surgery where you have here the staple line that we use to you know, resect the nodule. And then here you can see a nodule start forming again, as well as here, right? So that's one situation that again, you can see that in about 10% of the time um, after surgery. <clears throat> Um, and uh, sometimes also lesions can, you know, one of the concern we get um, from lung metastasis is when uh, the lesions start touching the, the edge here, you know, this is the rib cage, that's a layer called pleura. And so when the lesions start touching the pleura, these cells can migrate to that pleural space and cause some uh, more dis dissemination in the pleura, which becomes much more difficult to treat. It's not, it's, it's certainly not that common in colorectal cancer as we see for other cancers such as sarcoma, for example. Now, in terms of uh, stereotactic radiation, it's very well tolerated. There is minimal side effects, some fatigue. Sometimes you can have a lung inflammation and require some prednisone to treat that. Um, but most of the time is about three to five days of treatment and uh, it does not preclude other treatments immediately after. Um, but it also has a recurrence rate. And in fact, for colorectal cancer, I'm going to show you, uh, there was a uh, relatively recent study showing that for colorectal cancer, SBRT fails in about 40% of the time. So it's higher than for other cancers. Uh, when I say fail, again, you treated one or two specific nodules and that area that was treated start growing again. So the tumor was not completely killed, okay? So that happens in about 40% in colorectal cancer, where it's about less uh, for other cancers. Um, you can have rib fractures if the lesion is too close to the rib. Um, and um, you can't have, most of the time, if it fails, you can't have the radiation again in that same spot, okay? And uh, there are some patients that have pulmonary fibrosis that they cannot have SBRT, but again, that's a rare disease and it's probably not too relevant for most of you. Um, so there are, again, some locations which are challenging for SBRT. So if it's too close to the rib, like this one here, uh, you can see my my arrow here. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So so if you have uh, too close to the rib, or if it's too close to this central area here, which are the blood vessels and the airway, that's an area that you can have more significant toxicity from the local radiation. Um, and uh, you can also have failure, as I mentioned. This is one patient that was treated. Uh, in this location here, and then you can see six months later, it's bigger, which means that, uh, you know, it hasn't worked. Um, this is another patient. Uh, this is a patient with colorectal cancer that received SBRT in 2016. And then in 2017, you see that it's just kind of a scar there, which is expected from SBRT. But then in 2018, it starts growing again. So that's a failure of SBRT. And uh, this patient went then to surgery to have this removed. So if SBRT fails, we uh, sometimes can rescue that with uh, what we call salvage surgery, you know, and resect the area that was previously treated with radiation. But that's why uh, it's very important to have uh, that discussion up front. I'm going to mention about that. Uh, this is a patient that had the rib fracture. You know, that's the lesion here. And then you can see there is a crack in the rib now after SBRT. It treated the lesion, it didn't come back, but the patient became 
uh, quite debilitated with chronic pain because of that rib fracture and had to be on opioids. And so it had, has had a significant effect um, on patient quality of life. So in terms of the general principles, um, again, um, you know, this is um, a large, this is registry data from an international uh, registry and uh, basically shows, you know, overall the five-year survival oops, for patients that present with pulmonary metastasis is about uh, 45%, okay? Um, now, um, there are uh, factors, and this is more specific for colorectal cancer, uh, which tell us if you have less, equal or less than three lesions, then five years survival for those patients, it's about, you know, almost 60%. Whereas if you have more than three lesions, that drops to about 30%, right? Um, again, um, I think those results are a bit better today. Uh, with more systemic therapy options we have now um, as well. And uh, also, as I'm going to show you with some of the innovation uh, as well. Now, <clears throat> these are uh, very important prognostic factors. Uh, and when you look at risk ratio here it is uh, basically, you know, how much each of these factors here um, have adverse uh, prognostic effect. So, um, you know, you'll see that most of them, it's very little, right? You see gender, um, as I mentioned to you, if you had a previous liver metastasis, extra thoracic, it's just 1.2 effect. Uh, your preoperative CEA level doesn't affect too much at all. Uh, so we don't use that. The size of the lesion, it's also not something that affects too much. But this is a big one, okay? If you look at lymph mediastinal lymph node metastasis, there is then your risk of uh, not doing well is 8.2 times higher, okay? Than someone that doesn't have this lymph node metastasis. And um, having repeated pulmonary metastasectomy, meaning repeated surgery when nodules come back, it's a protective factor. You can see here, it, it's 0 0.05 is less than one, means that it, it improves your prognosis if you can have repeated operations, okay? Um, so generally, because of those findings, uh, if, a, if someone presents with lymph node metastasis, we tend not to do surgery and just manage with systemic therapy and radiation, and again, here just to show how, you know, this is this is like 60 uh, months or so five years. You can see patients that have repeated surgery, they do quite a bit better. You can see here up to 90% survival in, you know, in this series versus the ones that don't go to surgery, okay? But again, there is also here as what we call selection bias because perhaps the patients that don't go to surgery are the ones that have other issues going on as well, or too many lesions and, and so on and so forth. Now, of course, uh, you know, the ideal uh, way to determine if surgery truly helps with increasing patient uh, control of the disease and survival would be to do a randomized trial. The problem is we, you know, was always very difficult to recruit patients for that, like this, uh, they aim, like this is a, a trial from the UK, they aim to recruit 500 patients and they end up recruiting only uh, 60. And uh, the reason for that is because it's very difficult, if a patient comes to see me with, let's say two lung lesions, and then I'm going to say, we're going to randomize you to stay just on chemo versus randomized removing those nodules, the vast majority of the patients, they don't want to do that. They just want the nodules removed. And, um, you know, again, um, you know, that comes out also from the concept that 
chemotherapy doesn't provide a chance of cure. And we do know that uh, uh, patients we remove lung nodules from metastasis, we have achieved cure um, in, you know, in a substantial number of patients, uh, especially when they are well selected for that. Now, when we compare surgery with SBRT, uh, the best study for colorectal is this one from the MD Anderson. And again, they show here, as I mentioned to you, this is only colorectal. And um, you have about 40% chance of recurrence um, in the local area of treatment with SBRT, whereas you have um, a little bit less than 20% with surgery. So whenever uh, you know surgery is feasible um, and with low morbidity, we tend to prefer surgery. Um, now, um, if we assume that both treatments have similar control, then how to select is very patient specific. And, um, and that's why we have our lung metastasis program, which is quite unique here at UHN. We discuss every patient in a multidisciplinary fashion with surgeons, uh, radiation oncologists, uh, uh, thoracic radiologists to review the imaging and so on. And, um, and then we uh, make a plan in a multidisciplinary fashion uh, to what we think is best for the patient. Um, and uh, typically we would consider SBRT if we need to remove a large part of the lung, like a lobectomy, with a high chance of future recurrence. Um, if you have multiple lesions where we can do minimal invasive surgery, um, if some of the lesions can be treated with SBRT, and if the patient has medical comorbidities, then we tend to avoid surgery as well. Just to show you again a few examples, uh, you know, this patient had uh, colon cancer 18 months prior, and then he presented with these uh, three lung nodules here, one here and one here. So again, this is uh, quite uh, typical. Um, this is a 76 year old, again, one lesion here, one lesion here, one lesion here. And in these cases, we made a combination of, you know, a couple of lesions we did surgery, and one lesion uh, we did SPRT. So you can also combine these treatments to minimize um, the morbidity of the treatment, avoiding, for example, the need to remove larger parts of the lung. And uh, as I mentioned here, post-treatment, you have some scar, which is expected. Uh, this is another patient, just as an example, uh, that uh, sometimes during the wait time for surgery, you can have the SBRT done in the few lesions that are too deep in the lung that we don't think surgery will be good. And then, you know, a few weeks later, you can have the surgery to remove the remaining of the lesions. Uh, this is uh, another situation that had one lesion on the right treated with SBRT, and we did surgery on the left side. So we, we only had surgery in one side of the chest and this patient is doing very well. She is now almost 10 years from this treatment. Um, and uh, this is a very small lesion in a young patient. Um, again, it's very small, but it's very deep in the lobe. So we would need to do a lobectomy here. And, um, and in this case, we did SBRT. And you can see here, there is this scar related to the SBRT that we can just follow. So just to finish this part, um, both surgery and SBRT results in good control and low toxicity in selected patients, and they should be seen as complementary options. Um, we don't have randomized trials, but the patient selection is the most important, and having this multidisciplinary input is very uh, critical. Uh, so we can decide a very detailed plan uh, for uh, each specific patient. Now, um, I go, this is just to show uh, quickly, you know, does it have any difference between minimal invasive surgery or open surgery? 
And uh, we did this study again, looking at uh, you know colorectal cancer lung resections uh, in our uh, division here. And uh, we we had like uh, thirty five percent, so uh, over two hundred patients. We had thirty five percent received minimum invasive surgery, sixty five received open surgery, and uh, we didn't see really any difference in survival, which tells us yes, you can do minimum invasive surgery as well, and it don't compromise outcomes. Um, and uh, basically, 25% uh, of the patients here uh, had recurrence in the in the side that was treated with uh, minimal invasive, and 20% in the open group that things recurred in that specific side where the surgery was done. So, um, so basically, you know, if you have like three or less lesions, we tend to do minimal invasive surgery. If you have more than three lesions, we tend to do open surgery because then we have to examine the lung. So if you have three or more lesions, it's very possible then when we examine your lung with our hand inside of your chest, we can find sometimes more nodules that actually the CT was showing. And that's why that true uh, detailed examination is important when you have more lesions. Now, uh, one of the questions, uh, you know, that uh, uh, we have uh, always asked and why we go and do the surgery and a few months later or a year later, two years later, we have new nodules in the lungs, right? And, um, one of the most likely explanation is that during the tumor develop, the development in, in, in the intestine, these cancer cells migrate to the lung. And you know, over the years, they, they show up as nodules. And uh, you know, when we do surgery, we only can see this lesion here that we can see on the CT scan. But when you look on the histology, there is this very small cluster of cancer cells that the CT scan cannot show. A CT scan just show this big one here, okay, the blue one, and uh, and so we call this micrometastasis, and this is not targeted during surgery, um, and and that's uh, one of the reasons why we started this project again now probably ten years ago from the. I would say from the initial lab developed concept concepts, uh, uh, technology, uh, small animal, large animal studies, um, until we went to the clinics. But the concept is basically that during the surgery we would give a high dose chemotherapy to the to the whole lung tissue, uh, but that chemotherapy wouldn't go to the patient blood circulation because we would isolate the lung from the bloodstream of the patient. Um, and um, this was uh, derived from this development here. So this is a, uh, this is a human lung uh, that is being treated outside the body here. You see the lung moving there. Um, and um, this is called the ex vivo lung perfusion. So we developed this technology and also the liquid that goes through the lung to maintain the lung in a good condition um, and all these tubings and membranes and, and so on to protect the lung. And so, you know, then um, we do this, of course, to treat donor lungs for transplantation. But then the next question was, can we actually treat the patient's own lungs, you know, using this technology without having to remove the lung out of the body, but just simulate the removal. And the simulation of the removal is actually when you cut the, uh, the, the supply of blood going into the lung um, during the procedure. And so, as I mentioned, we've done several preclinical studies um, and, and then we started on clinical trials. Uh, this was, uh, uh, we, we started the first patients on this on sarcoma with a chemotherapy called doxorubicin. So this was the, the first patient ever that we did that. 
Um, and uh, he was uh, sent home, uh, able to go home in six days. Uh, and we continued as a phase one clinical trial for sarcoma, but then we moved on quickly for colorectal cancer. And because this was not done before, um, we had no idea you know, how much chemo we could use. Um, because again, you're not giving the chemo to the whole patient, you're just giving to an organ. And so we did some studies first in animals to try to have an idea of, of what is the maximum dose we can give that the lung can tolerate. Um, and, and then we went to start the clinical trials, which is this one registered here uh, in the clinicaltrials.gov. And um, so this is the protocol. Um, and, um, you know, it's patients with colorectal cancer. They have to have bilateral lung metastasis with more than three lesions and uh, uh, absence of extra pulmonary disease except liver, okay? And, um, and this is a dose escalation design. So we can see we did one uh, very low dose and then uh, and then three patients in each of these doses are happy to tell that we are on this phase here right now. And uh, we have already three patients scheduled for that. So very quickly, we're going to go to the 30. And what, the reason this is a phase one trial, uh, be, you know, because the main goal here is to determine the safety of the procedure. And you know, as we increase the doses, will we see some lung toxicity, which is going to be reflected by some inflammation in the lung. And because of that, although we are treating and removing the lesions in both lungs, we're just giving the chemotherapy to one of the lungs, okay? Now, as soon as we finish this phase here, then we're going to go to a phase two trial which we um, already have uh, funding for that from the Canadian Cancer Society and yeah, and uh, um, uh, CCRN has helped us to obtain that and thank you so much for that. Um, basically then what we'll do is when, you know, if we want to be really very impactful, we need to do this procedure on both lungs because the disease comes back on both lungs, right? And so what we'll do in the phase two, is to use the dose that was selected from this study here as a safe dose, the maximum, maximum, the highest dose possible that is safe. And then we're going to treat both lungs and remove the lesions from both lungs. And that's where we hope to see some significant benefit in terms of, you know, decreasing these rates of 50, 60, 70% of recurrence, you know, to maybe a uh, much lower uh, percentage. And uh, uh, here is just for you, I mean, it's a busy table, but this is just here, some characteristics of this first 10 patients. And uh, first of all, I wanna show here, this is length of stay in hospital, okay? So um, it, it, although this is a relatively big surgery, and invasive, of course, we have to go around blood vessels, remove a lot of lesions. You know, most of the patients, they leave hospital around seven days, okay? So um, that's one good thing. And you can see here, these are, are very, very high risk patients. Look at the number of lesions that they have here. So we have patients with 21 lesions, 16 lesions, you know, and then even eight to 10, so, so these patients, they are not considered today as surgical candidates, okay? So if we, if we receive a patient with 10 lesions, we're not going to say, okay, let's just remove the lesions. That's something that is not done in pretty much any place, okay? Now we are starting to do that with the chemotherapy treatment at the same time. And, um, and these were the doses here, and we can see the doses have not impacted length of stay. Patients have done well. And um, although this uh, phase one is not intend intended to look at, at anti-cancer benefits yet, because it's not powered for that in terms of number of patients, uh, we have noted some interesting findings. And one of them is because, you know, first of all, 
the side we do the chemotherapy is the one that has more lesions, okay? So that's the side which has a higher risk of recurrence, okay? And yet, in the sides that we have done surgery and the chemo, we have seen 20% of recurrence compared to 50% of recurrence in the lung that was not treated with the chemo, just with the surgery, okay? Yeah. So that's the first signs we're seeing that perhaps this would be effective. Again, I want to put a, a caution here that is still very early. We're just kind of one year out, but nevertheless, you know, the patient is kind of their own control here, right? Because, you know, we're looking at, they are recurring more in the lung. So two patients already, I had to do surgery in the side that was not treated with chemo because there was a recurrence there, for example, right? Um, so that's encouraging. And um, and again, I'm quite, uh, quite excited and optimistic that especially when we move now to the phase two trial, we're going to do on both sides, you know, maybe we will be able to reduce the recurrence rates from this, you know, 60% to, you know, hopefully to the 20% range. So Dr. Saipel, if I yes. may, yes. I, can, can we go back to yes, that yes. slide, Sorry. please? Yeah. Yes. Because this is such a remarkable slide. I know it represents 10 patients, but these are 10 patients wherein only two, correct me if I'm wrong, only two patients recurred in the side in the side where the IVLP was actually performed. Is that correct? That's correct. Up up to up to now, yeah. Up to now, yeah, to date. Yeah. But I mean, take a look at the side where the IVLP was not performed. Right. Fifty percent recurred. Yeah. So I mean, everything else remaining equal. This is. This is why I, I had to emphasize my outlook for patients who, you know, who are diagnosed with metastatic colorectal lung meds. The outlook is so positive moving forward because it's data such as this mm -hmm. that is moving the needle forward. This is outstanding. I can't wait for you to get to 40 micrograms, right? It's micrograms per 40, mil? Yeah, yeah. 40 will be the maximum one. Yeah. 40. Oh, and then you'll select the appropriate dose yeah. for phase yeah. two, and it'll be in both sides of the lungs. Yeah. That it, yeah, like this, is, ladies and gentlemen, like I don't know if you can appreciate this, but I remember when I started this journey with my dad back in 2006, there was nothing, nothing. And this, this is proving to be so promising. And that's why our, that's why I say, Let's run to Dr. Seidel. I mean, not everybody will qualify, but at least they have a fighting chance right. to, to, to try to qualify. This is fantastic, Dr. Seidel. Yeah, yeah, we are, we are quite optimistic on that. Um, again, I think still the one challenge are the patients that have too many lesions, right, that we can't remove it uh, because there are just too many. Um, and uh, those... Um, you know, the, the one good thing about this method is that the method now is well established. And so we could test different therapies as well, right? So of course here we're using oxaloplatin, mm -hmm. which is a very well-known drug, but nothing prevents us to use other therapies like some immunotherapy mm -hmm. approaches, you know, uh, some gene therapy approaches, some, you know, uh, mRNA approaches. So a lot of the biological agents now, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. could apply here. I was, I was actually talking to the uh, one of the directors at Moderna yesterday um, about this uh, because they are entering the cancer space as well with mRNA. Yeah. And, uh, they, they seem to be very interested in the fact that you can treat the organ specifically because when you inject mRNA in the bloodstream, all, all goes to the liver it's, and sits in the liver, right? The liver uptake all of them. So here you avoid this because it doesn't go to the blood, right? 
so it, it does really open a lot of opportunities for some of the therapies that are not possible to be given, you know, uh, IV, right? So I, I think uh, it, it's it's quite promising um, along those lines. But may I just ask one last question before you proceed? And you will likely be addressing this in the event that there are too many metastases identified in both sides. Um, of the lungs, is there an opportunity to perhaps just deliver the IVLP? Yeah, so so in the phase two trial, we, we hope to have an arm for that, um, you know, um, and, and see, I mean, I'm a, I, have, I have to say I'm a little bit less optimistic about this working well in that scenario. Uh, but, you know, it remains to be seen, maybe when we go to the high doses, maybe that, you mm -hmm. know, super high doses, maybe yeah. that would be, would be effective. Uh, I mean, that's something we will have to, to, to study and see. Kind of like, if I may, kind of like the way HAPE is working for patients who are diagnosed with unresectable liver metastases to perhaps get them to resectability. Mm -hmm. See, kind of like yes. the way my yeah. brain is working. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. In, in that, in the, on, along those lines, if you do yeah. have a very good response and, yeah. and reduce the number of lesions. To yeah. Feed, you know, yes, yes. Uh, okay. that, that's, uh, you know, that's a little bit of a different concept, but there is a, a you know, there is a substantial number of patients that, um, that have, um, a lot of lesions, right? That cannot be resected. So we need to find, of course, therapies for these patients as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. One one thing that uh, we would like to think also for the future, as we are entering more, and you know, I know Gonzalo was talking to you today mm -hmm. about the whole concept of transplant oncology. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, maybe those patients that we can't resect similarly to what they are doing liver, you know, with liver transplant, you know, maybe we could also consider lung transplant, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, it has, to, again, uh, th there are things we need to uh, work along those lines in terms of decreasing immunosuppression yeah. and and other things to, to prevent, uh, you know, aggressive disease recurrence. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But but we are we are doing a lot of uh, a lot of studies in lung transplant now. That the, the ultimate goal is um, not to need to use immunosuppression, right? Mm -hmm. So if we modify the organ in a way we don't need to use immunosuppression, then then doing transplant for cancer it's much more reasonable because you know if you're not going to put patients on 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 macrolimus or other drugs that decrease the immune system, then it's much more safe to do it for cancer patients. Okay. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So we're trying to, to make some progress there. And, uh, yeah. and again, thanks for all the support. And I don't know if anyone has any question, we'll be happy to. Hello? Okay, all right. Yeah, so if we can come out of uh, uh, the sharing. I'll, I'll come in five minutes. Yeah. And Philomena, do you want to just stop the recording there and then we'll welcome everybody to come back?